is Laura McKee, and we are in the museum at the Workhouse Art Center in Lorton, Virginia. The prison started as a workhouse for the District of Columbia in 1910, and it continued in operation until 2001. Teddy Roosevelt thought that the, the DC was a good place to set up a model prison. There wasn't enough room in the District of Columbia for the sort of prison farm that was envisioned, so they had to look elsewhere and settle on this uh, piece of land which was on the Occoquan River because they would be bringing prisoners to the prison here in Lorton by boat. So the first group of men came in the summer of 1910. And they had dormitories and then they had common rooms. And that was what they lived in until um, the middle of the 1920s. All of the brick buildings were built by prisoners and all of the bricks that you see here were made by the prisoners. They made hundreds of thousands of bricks and those bricks were often taken into the District of Columbia. So as you drive around DC, you'll see a lot of similar bricks in buildings that were built in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. The prisoners who were here reflected very much what was going on. The prison could have been considered a model prison into the, the end of the 1950s. First of all, drugs became a real problem in the District of Columbia, and many, many of the men who were sentenced to prison were arrested on drug charges. Another aspect of that was mandatory sentencing. Many younger folks were imprisoned here uh, for long prison sentences. Therefore, the crowding became more and more intense. A lawyer from New York University came down to do a study of the whole idea of dormitories and prisons and discovered that for many of the prisoners, they never felt safe to sleep at night, to go fully asleep because with the dormitories, all of them were unlocked and somebody could sneak out or sneak up in the middle of the night. And since many of the prisoners had weapons of one kind or another, um, they could stab somebody in the dark at night. And it happened more frequently than we would like to say. Now, some of the older and more experienced, if you want to call it that, they basically ran the place. And it got to be a pretty, pretty zooey place around here. For, for many, many years, the uh, employees here lived in the community and were very glad of the jobs. As a matter of fact, in the 1940s, uh, the prison was the largest employer in Fairfax County. But as time went on, as you, as you well know, uh, houses um, began to be built further and further out of town. Suburbia moved uh, and people began to feel that they didn't want to live near a prison. So the first agitation to close the prison down actually began in the 70s. We say the last prisoner left here in November of, of 2001 but many of the prisoners had been transferred in the years before because they knew it was coming. Uh, DC prisoners are now scattered in prisons from Maine to Oregon. The property belonged to the federal government. The over 2,000 acres was sold to Fairfax County for $4.1 million, which was a real bargain. And the idea of an art center really came from the from the community living around here. It opened in 2004, so in the three years uh, between the closing and the um, leasing of this 55 acres to the workhouse, which is a nonprofit organization, a number of the buildings were raised. As part of a National Historic Trust property, the buildings that were built before 1971 had to remain. It has a history, and the history reflects a lot of what was going on nationally as well. There was a women's work here, house here which opened in 1912, and that is where the women were uh, to be imprisoned when they were uh, arrested at the White House. One of the accounts you'll hear at Lorton is that of the silent sentinels in the Night of Terror. The National Women's Party was one of the more militant suffragist organizations. Its tactics included lobbying, parades, speech tours, and generating publicity through its nonviolent protests. 
and it was Lucy Burns and Alice Paul. They had met in prison in England where they had been um, demonstrating for suffrage in England. And when they came back to the United States, they became involved with the women's movement here and eventually founded the National Women's Party. When they first started picketing in the beginning of the summer of 1917, the president was not happy to have them there, but he, he endured them. And it wasn't until the latter part of the summer when the uh, war effort had begun in the First World War and some of the signs that were being used were very uncomplimentary of President Wilson. And it is then when he became, I think, embarrassed. Although protesters emphasized that their protests were silent, nonviolent, and within legal parameters, arrests were made on charges of obstructing traffic and unlawful assembly. This led the NWP and allies to insist arrests be viewed as political in nature. At the time, we must remember that the District of Columbia was managed by three commissioners, and those commissioners were appointed by the president. So when he said, get rid of those women, the commissioners then talked to the police chief, and the police chief said, okay, we'll start arresting them. First, it was for a, a very a fine or a short jail sentence. Um, by the fall, women were being sent for short sentences to the women's workhouse down here. The food was terrible. The conditions were abysmal. Lucy Burns uh, was here for a short sentence. She actually was imprisoned here three separate times. When she left the second time, the superintendent, Whitaker, said to her, I want you to go back and tell your group that uh, if they come back here again, it's going to be very, very different, and you will be sorry that you came. And it was a true threat that didn't stop them. 32 women were arrested and were brought down to the workhouse. When they got here, they were ushered into the presence of the superintendent, Mr. Whitaker, and he began to berate them, and then he allowed the guards who were here to begin picking them up and throwing them in cells, uh, twisting their arms, uh, Lucy Burns actually refused to wear a prison costume and so they forced her to take her dress off and she stood in her uh, undergarment. This was November in Virginia and there was no heat and she had her hands were up over her head. She was left there all night. Other women were dragged, thrown, and beaten. This night of November 14th through 15th, 1917, came to be known as the Night of Terror for the crescendo in the guards' brutality that occurred. The women were not allowed to speak. Those who refused to eat, and they actually put them in solitary confinement in the uh, men's workhouse where there were cells. This was unheard of to put a woman in the men's workhouse. The hunger strikes that followed resulted in forced feedings. I will say that despite the treatment that the women received, no one died and the injuries that they received were superficial. The injury that they received to their mental condition though was considerably different because they were scared to death. One of the matrons here did in fact smuggle out a note which got to their lawyer and the lawyer came down from D.C. and asked Whitaker to interview the women to find out how things were going and he was refused. He then decided what was best to do was to get a writ of habeas corpus to bring the women out of the prison and so that they could be, uh, how their physical condition could be judged. The judge at the Northern District of Virginia uh, so ordered and the women were brought to the courthouse in Alexandria. The lawyer told the, the presiding judge that these women had been sentenced to jail in D.C. and they were not in D.C. Uh, and so the judge ruled that they must be released from the prison and taken back to the jail in the District of Columbia.
the jailers there realized that they simply did not have enough room for 30 women who were going to be on hunger strikes. And so they ended up releasing all the women. The protests continued until the president was, I think, forced by the, uh, the press and by just the groundswell of support for women having the right to vote. He went to the Congress and said that they needed to pass an amendment. During that session of, of the House, it passed the bill, but the Senate did not. During the next recess that the Congress had, women began picketing again, but this time they went to Lafayette Square, right across the street from the White House. These ramped up 1919 protests to push for passage of the amendment included fires in which speeches from President Wilson were burned. Some of them climbed up on Lafayette's statue and were arrested for defacing public property. National Women's Party members and their allies continued to protest and speak out until the amendment was finally passed by Congress in 1919 and ratified by the states in 1920. The Workhouse Arts Center is now in the process of renovating a building to be used as a museum dedicated to the struggle of these women. When they first met with President Wilson in the winter of 1917, the women of the NWP were dismissed and told that they would need to cultivate support from the public. Lucy Burns, Alice Paul, and countless others did exactly that and more fighting for both the right to vote and for our rights as Americans to free assembly and free speech. I think it's, it was incredibly brave of them to do what they did because the women who were picketing the White House went into it knowing that they very likely would be arrested. They were willing to give their lives for women having the right to vote. And I think that it behooves us now to remember that.